Okay, um, I'll get started. Welcome everyone to our sixth session of Gabelli Forward. It's a new innovative way to connect industry professionals and students together in a teaching environment and teaching uh, forum. So my name is Linda Luca, and uh, I will be your host for our panel, which is Advertising Today, Keeping Brands in Touch in a Touchless Society. Now, I know many of you may know me as your marketing instructor in integrated marketing communications. But before I started here at Gabelli, I was for many years in the mad world of advertising. And um, during those years, it gave me a great thrill and, and privilege to work with some of the best and the brightest. And I'm so happy to say that today I have some of the best and the brightest in the industry joining us, um, three senior executives from different aspects of um, advertising. So I'd like to give you a little bit of background about each one um, joining us today is Stacy Lesser. Stacy wants to give a little wave. Stacy is the Chief Strategic Officer at Merkley and Partners, which is a full service ad agency within the Omnicom group. Stacy brings a wealth of experience um, to her clients. Uh, and right now her clients include some very famous iconic brands such as Mercedes Benz, Vic uh, Pens, Florida Nat Naturals, and um, White Castle. But her experience is much broader than that. She's worked on technology, packaged goods. In fact, we shared a client, Unilever. Um, she's worked on uh, finance and tech and, and startups. So Stacy's role and what, what makes Stacy so special is that she is the one who really provides the insights on the consumer and what motivates the consumer and puts that into a cultural context and background so that creatives can build on these insights and tap into her insights to create some really breakthrough disruptive campaigns. She's the catalyst. Um, and I have to say, when I worked with her on Unilever, she was that spark for our creative teams. So um, Stacy has a lot to share with us today. Um, also joining us is Lynn Riley. Um, Lynn is the EVP Global Chief Growth Officer at UM Worldwide. Now UM is also part of the larger IPG network, which includes IPG media brands, as well as a number of um, ad agencies. UN, UM rather, operates in over 100 uh, countries. They plan and invest the media dollars for the brands to ensure that the consumer and the audience hear, see, or actually experience the brand's message at the right time. So her roster of clients, you know, starting with a in the alphabet is American Express, BMW, Coca-Cola, Accenture, going on to Sony, Spotify, and a whole number of others. Um, I originally met Lynn at my time at McCann, New York, and Lynn was our um, leader in new business. She developed the pitch strategy, the internal pitch stra strategy to help us land our roster of clients. And then she moved over to the media side at UM and has been, you know, the, in, the, in the vanguard of helping UM's growth in the past 10 years. So she has a keen eye for seeing what's going on in the industry and anticipating what, what might happen and bringing that um, to bear and also finding new uh, ways for a brand to you know, deliver their message in new channels and partner uh, in content in very fresh and innovative ways. And then our third panelist is Amy Luca, who is joining us from uh, the West Coast. She is president and head of international at uh, Collectively, which is a pioneering company in this whole field of media influencers. Um, 
She also has an array of clients starting with Unilever, with Dove, Axe, Magnum, and then beyond Unilever, Diageo, uh, Delta Airlines, Clinique, and more. Collectively is part of a group of, um, it's a global, you and Mr. Jones, a global brand tech uh, company, one, one of the first uh, in the world. But Amy's also a pioneer herself because she started in advertising in digital marketing um, early on when it was first emerging as a force in, um, in advertising. Uh, she, she started with the big Pepsi refresh uh, project, one of the biggest social media impact uh, uh, um, projects at the time. Um, from there, she answered YNR's call to go to Shanghai in China and work on uh, The Gap and some other accounts. And then another move took her to Sydney, Australia with GP YNR, where she worked on um, LG, Colgate Palmolive, Revlon, and a few others. Um, and in case you're wondering, Amy is my cousin. Uh, and um, she also is an adjunct a professor of digital marketing at the Marshall School of Business uh, at USC in the executive MBA program. And um, so, I, so I guess you could say that advertising and teaching seem to run in the Luca family. So, okay, let's, um, let's get started. And um, I just wanna take something off here. Sorry. Um, okay, Stacy, I wanted to start with, with you. Um, for the past six months, we've all witnessed an enormous amount of upheaval in our daily lives. And Merkley is famous for helping their clients stay ahead of the curve. But how do you help them navigate when it's been just one hairpin gut-wrenching turn after another? You know, how did you navigate that? Well, Linda, that is an interesting question, to say the least. Um, I, I have to say, ironically, that while we're all living in this nightmare of what's going on in the world, we're also living a planner's dream because we're getting to watch behavior change in real time. And we're getting to see how people respond to things, not incrementally, but immediately. And so I've been fascinated by it. We have a thing at Merkley that we call the S-curve and we always try to keep our clients ahead of the curve. But what we find connects curves is what we call the chaos box. And I think it's pretty fair to say that we're living in the chaos box. We've always, we all talk at Merkley about chaos leading to change and innovation. What I've learned during this period, which is fascinating, is the interrelationship between chaos and innovation. And we're, because we are having to live through change immediately, we're adapting to it. And to say that we're at an inflection point has just been, you know, is, is to understate the level of change. But what we've relied on in helping our clients navigate that is in a lot of sense the same things that we've always used. We make sure that we understand the fundamentals of the brand and the business and where the brand and the consumer meet. We make sure that we're as up to the minute as we possibly can be on everything that's going on. When the, when the pandemic hit, my, my inbox became overrun with research reports from every company in the world wanting to help us figure out how to do it. And it became the, my job particularly, and my department's job to sift through those and to share that information with our clients and to help them navigate. One of the really interesting companies was called Canvas 8. And they came up with a, they've been studying consumer change for years and they taught us about the five stages of adjustment that are that individuals are going to, go, going to go through. Denial, anxiety, adjustment, 
reevaluation, and the new normal. And so we've been using those fundamentals as the backdrop for everything that we've been talking to our clients about and understanding how do we talk to people when they're living through denial? What's the tone of voice that we need to help them to deal with the anxiety that they're feeling as the world starts to shift? How do we help our, our clients and their products fit in as people are adjusting to a new way of life, living from home, having Zoom classes, communicating with one another through our computers? How do we make sure that our brands are present as consumers are reevaluating the needs that they have at a particular moment in time and make sure that our brand fits in there? And then how do we make sure that we are part of that new normal as mm. they have started to live it so that when we come out of this moment of change, we'll still be part of the, the, um, the equation. And I could go on and on, but I'm <laughs> going to stop because I know you have other questions to ask. But the big, the big, the number one answer is really listening to what's going on in the world, seeing what information is available and helping to distill it to make use of it in real oh. time. Okay, did you find, just one quick question, did you find yourself doing a lot more um, consumer, uh, you know, focus groups or qualitative or surveys uh, during this time, or did you rely on, you know, other research companies? We did a little of on our own, but we were more able to rely on others because there was so much information. So if we had follow-ups to the question, to some of the things that were emerging, we would throw out a quick panel question and mm -hmm. find out what people were doing. But there, it, the, I, I have to say that the, the research community really came forward and helped us all out. And I per, owe a debt of gratitude to them I, which I can't repay because my finance officer isn't giving me any money to subscribe to these great services, but <laughs> I, they, but they really did come through for all of us. Great. Great. So Lynn, turning to you, you know, you were <coughs> sitting in a different perspective, UM, you know, you, um, UM always uses data and science to invest money into a variety of, of different media channels and trying to optimize it. But all of a sudden, you know, the bottom fell out, uh, you know, airlines, travel, you know, entertainment, sports, no one could do anything. So how, how did you navigate with, with your clients? So I think a lot of our clients got the same research and went through the same phases that um, Stacy's Canvas 8 report um, said. And what we saw was there were clients who were very reactive and said, cut all my spending now, pull me out, get me out, and I'm going to remain dark until we come out of this. Um, not, And not just because we're their agent, but we didn't think that was the right response. And so we really needed to adjust how we planned and how we brought recommendations forth. And we did use data because there's so much data available. And actually what we did was something pretty interesting. And we looked to countries that were ahead of us that had already gone through COVID and were maybe coming out of the end and looked at industry by industry, how did they react? How did they recover? when did demand start to increase and how could we mirror that to better guide our clients because we first wanted to make sure they had the best response to covid and all the other social unrest that was going on and then we wanted to make sure that they had the best recovery so one of the clients that i mentioned was a financial service brand who decided they needed to go dark and we realized you can't go dark people are actually depending upon you and mm. but this is how you should come back and we created something called the demand forecaster which literally goes industry by industry and some of it's rather intuitive like of course travel is going to have a longer recovery process but things like auto 
going back up very quickly and thing and we can do it because of the way the the data aligns with what we have in the states anyway we could do it state by state so now we're presenting plans there's a cpg brand i have i don't know how much i'm allowed to say but you can probably all figure it out it's a it's um dependent upon halloween so we created a state by state demand forecast of who's going to be trick or treating this year because that's their super bowl that's their black friday and so it's been interesting that california while it's having a lot of issues still with covid is actually looking to get out well maybe not now with the all the other situations going on there but the demand for trick or treating was high but places like florida and new york was flat and we could then gauge where they should be ramping up sales it's even helped our clients think about their inventory and supply chain and where they needed to make sure that they were there to meet the demand great great wow that sounds in very interesting so amy who is coming to us from california by the way how is the uh, air quality out there you are on mute, Amy. <laughs> Much better in my area today, which is great. Oh, right. good, good, nice good, good. So, Amy, my question for you is is a little bit similar in your area of um, social media influencers. You know, they depend on if they're in fashion or in restaurants. You know, uh, uh, their followers depend on what they say about food or travel. What do you do when they don't have access to those things? Did they gain more value or did they lose value? I mean, I think there's certain categories for sure that, um, you know, like Lynn and Stacy have said, have really dropped off a little bit at the beginning. Travel, of course. I mean, Delta Airlines is not going to go put a whole lot of investment in talking about destinations with influencers um, when, you know, people are not traveling. But there are other categories of influencers that really did uh, play an important role for brands um, and for us as an agency, listening to the influencers and what their audiences were talking about was extremely important. So um, categories like FMCG um, from the from the get go, um, lucky enough, we work on on Unilever brands, specifically Dove, they really took a immediate uh, you know, activity with influencers of using influencers to really promote the purpose side of their brand. Um, and we saw a lot of ramping up of influencer activity of using their influencer communities to communicate the commitment the brands had to their purpose. Um, uh, and specifically with Dove, uh, their care and concern for their the community um, related to their Wash to Care campaign. And then we extended that into self-esteem at home which was really, uh, you know, Dove has, you know, a decades long uh, heritage of talking about self-esteem issues. So it was very relevant to their brand message of support and uh, support. Um, I think from an info, for most influencers, there has been a hit on the inf to the influencer industry in terms of their income, because a lot of brands did pull back initially. And we are seeing now, um, it's just extremely volatile. Um, you know, we had a lot of campaigns that were slated to go for back to school. Um, and, you know, similarly in our industries, um, brands are thinking about it from a state to state situation. You know, do we do, um, you know, influencers in certain states uh, as opposed to a national uh, message when there's a lot of people still working, uh, you know, going, their kids are, you know, at home, they're not going uh, to, to campus or, we have a, a printer company that we work with and talking about homeschool, home office, all of a sudden is pivoted from, you know, what they would have said about back to school. So the biggest headline I can say from the last six months is that it's all about the pivot. How do we pivot the messaging? How do we utilize influencers in a different way um, that speak more to what the brand stands for and the brand purpose than just pitching product? Um, and that only works for brands that have a heritage of purpose and what we call brand say versus brand do. Like if they, they say it, they better be backing it up with some sort of a, an action on the brand's part. Um, so the brands that had a heritage in that definitely increased spend, increased communication. The mm -hmm. ones that did not have a heritage in that um, paused for a moment and, 
And we've been regrouping and re-strategizing that pivot of how do we effectively communicate to um, our audiences with influencers. Okay, great. So um, Stacy, bu building on that, Amy mentioned a, a couple of brands. Did, did you see any brands that you thought were, you know, really in tune, in touch, being authentic? Oh, you know, it's, it's, it was a really interesting moment because there were so many brands that were being inauthentic. And if mm -hmm. we had one more bank or insurance company or other large conglomerate telling us that they were there for us, we, where I was just going to really throw up. On the <laughs> other hand, there were some brands who were so, and I'm, not even Merkley brands, but there were some brands who were so clear in terms of what they had to offer to consumers early on. I don't know if anybody saw it. Hershey's ran a spot for s'mores. And, mm -hmm. and, it and it, you know, kind of spoke to people's need for comfort and the role that that brand could play in their lives. And it made you feel so good about Hershey's, not to mention, I suspect, that it drove sales of, of Hershey's chocolates. Um, on the other hand, um, it, making you feel good was Budweiser, who brought back the What's Up campaign, <laughs> but they did it by having different people in their individual apartments speaking to one another on the phone. And so they helped us feel more connected to their brand and to one another and reminded us the role that they could play and, and allowed us to laugh at the situation that we're in. And I, and I think that those were, that's some of the most important things that brands can do. And I've been fascinated to watch or as we went through the, the continuum of, of adjustment, um, the auto companies were one of the first actually to really benefit beyond the, the packaged goods companies. Like Florida's Natural, for example, didn't have to do anything and we, our sales went through the roof we had the best year that we've had in years and years because people wanted orange juice. Orange juice had been on the decline because there were so many other beverage choices. And all of a sudden the, uh, the promise of vitamin C and that protection against disease was mm. driving it out of the, out, off the shelves. But in the auto business, if you think back, um, Lexus, I think it was Lexus, I don't mean to cast aspersions, was early to the party in terms of talking about touch-free service. And they were speaking to what, what I learned uh, was um, safety theater. Anything that we could do to make people feel more comfortable and safer, even if it wasn't necessary, made them feel better. So they talked about this touchless service in which they would pick up your car or deliver your new car to your home. And that spoke to some people. But at Mercedes, we did one of the best performing ads we've done in ages, which shows a couple shopping for a car remotely. And the salesman is in the car and they ask him to try and different features of the car. And he changes the lighting. He shows them <laughs> how something works. They then said, get in the back seat and talk it like you're our, our kids. And he goes, are we there yet? And, <laughs> and Mercedes tests all of its ads. And we tested this one on Ace. And it was one of our best performing ads. And, and I think it, it did tremendous things for the brand because it made the brand so human and so approachable, which is something that we don't normally think of Mercedes as being. Um, right. For White Castle, we've been having the best time we've had in ages. Um, we created a, a character called Mr. Gandhi, and Mr. Gandhi had a show called Late Night with Mr. Gandhi, and he would show up in his apartment dressed in outrageous outfits <laughs> and talk to people about White Castle. And White Castle has a very strong association with Late Night. Mm -hmm. So Late Night with Mr. Gandhi was the perfect thing. We've created, we for many, many years, we've had the Crave Pack. But this year we created the Crave Clutch. 
and the Crave Clutch holds more sliders than ever before. So you can have some nice socially distanced um, meals with your friends and families and bring home a Crave Clutch of 20 sliders. Um, outside of, um, of, of our own agency, I thought that Peloton really stepped it up. Mm -hmm. they, they made themselves available. They talked about family fitness. Um, National Geographic talks of, is offering homeschool tools. So I, I think that Amy's point is so spot on in terms of really understanding and being genuine and authentic because if you just kind of like try on a purpose as you're trying on a pair of shoes, people see right through you. But when you're real, they, they get it and they really appreciate you and what you have to offer. And these relationships, I believe in my heart of hearts, are going to stick. And the way that people feel about these brands, because it's a long enough time, you know, they say it takes, I don't know what it is, 40 days to form a new habit. We've had more than the 40 days to form new habits and brands that have gotten out there and stayed with their consumers are going to win. Good, good. Lynn, how about you? What, what has impressed you during this time, you know, of brands, let's say, doing it right? Yeah, I think to build on what Stacey's saying, it's the authenticity and the connection to what your brand does for people and making sure you follow through on that. Like, I think about the backlash Amazon got for thanking their workers, but then it was discovered they're not giving them the proper, you know, PPE and they're not paying them anymore. So it was like, great, spend your money on an ad to thank them, but don't pay your actual workers. So, and then I'll, I'll use my own roster to kind of pick from first and then talk about some other brands. So like American Express was one of the brands who wanted to go dark. They didn't, they were, they're a very obviously by nature conservative com company. And the recommendation from us um, was actually, you have a real moment here to put money behind small business, which is suffering more than anyone else um, out there right now. And their kind of small business Saturday is an institution. So what, and what we did more than, than just promote small business and like, in like some sort of ad campaign. We actually moved up Small Business Saturday. It's gonna happen all throughout October. And we're rewarding from Amex's own pocket, we're rewarding cardholders for shopping small. So you'll get like a credit back. So not only did we just talk about it, we did something extra to make sure that small businesses are getting the support. And, and even in these times when people are you know, God forbid shuttering and it's really tough, especially on the mom and pops on Main Street, we had more small businesses sign up to be part of the program. And so I thought that was a really good way of putting your money where your mouth is, if you will. Um, Hershey's one of our clients, I can confirm chocolate sales are up 9%. Um, and what's been interesting is what's, and what's changed is people are now buying chocolate online and their e-commerce strategy was always weak to non-existent because they didn't need to, not because they were scared of it or whatever, but chocolate is the impulse purchase while you're waiting online at, at your drugstore or Target. So e-commerce was always kind of an afterthought, but now it's because it's, we've seen the clients come forward and say, how do I drive e-commerce? Because it's up double digits for the first time ever. Um, and then some brands I think that are outside of our roster. And again, it's just genuine authentic moments that people are like, oh, well that was nice. And who didn't need that in the past six months? Like Krispy Kreme gave away free donuts to first responders every Monday. Mm -hmm. And you know, like the things you can look at the Nike, Nike always does well and they're always good and whatever, but they really, I think, stepped up their game about how to enjoy fitness and, you know, linking into what Peloton did. I actually bought a Peloton as a consumer. Um, and I'm not saying I'm using it every day, but I'm saying it's here and I'm glad that it is because <laughs> I know that I can. So yeah. 
I think like those brands that really kind of were like, we're in this with you and we're going to get through this together. It, it's the more human you can be, especially in these times when things were so uncertain, I think we're, we're the most successful. And those habits we formed are going to stay with us when we hopefully all get on the other side of this. So mm -hmm. through the 40 days, I think things changed in 10 days and now they're going to stick. So when I think about um, j and J is our, probably our biggest global client and just the onslaught of telehealth and how you, how people are dealing, you know, people still had issues that weren't COVID related, but then were afraid to go to a doctor during this time. I, I think that will be a, the next big explosion that was bubbling and starting, but people were unsure. And now they're like, oh, I've had to use it. And now I feel comfortable with it. So I think that will definitely um, keep growing as we come out of the other side of this. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. It's, it, it's been an accelerator <laughs> for many of these kind of emerging trends that we saw starting to happen. And then all of a sudden it's ramped up. So Amy, yeah. what's, you know, what brands have, um, you know, uh, stuck out for you, you know, in this I think, you know, a lot of the, the personal care brands, I think definitely um, are a standout, at least at the beginning, um, because you had, you know, and once again, I'll, I'll, the one that I'm closest to, obviously, is Dove. Um, you know, we, there was, it was a whole global wash to care activity that a lot of brands really jumped onto, including, including Dove. Um, any of the ones that at the very beginning were focused on, um, really that the concern and care of, of the community seem to, to really stand out. But I think nowadays, the ones that um, are, are giving a little bit of relief, and actually it was nice to hear a little bit about the humor, because I think some of the humor and kind of those human insights, the Mercedes-Benz uh, example is a fantastic example of really being relevant um, and tapping into uh, you know, what's going on in the zeitgeist that people are, this is a new normal, but there doesn't have to, doesn't have to be the depressing new normal. Like, um, how do we get through it with a little bit of humor and levity? How do we uh, connect with our families? And I think there's been a, a few um, ads out there that have really tapped into this humor of the Zoom meeting that we're in right now. You know, it's just the um, the experience of of what we're kind of going through. We're kind of in it together. Um, and I, you know, the the added complexity, which we haven't really talked about in terms of just the COVID piece, but then you have the added complexity of of the BLM movement and all of the things that have come along that and how do brands navigate that part of it. And I think that's been really tricky for a lot of brands too, because they want to be seen as care and concern um, without um, dragging, you know, being too much into controversy. Um, so it's, it's been, that's been an interesting thing, but I did want to touch on one thing that, um, that Linda's brought up, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, and then Linda, you tapped on it too, which is this accelerator thing that's happening from a digital uh, perspective. So what stopped very quickly was experiential events, sponsorship, sports sponsorship, and all of a sudden brands, like you mentioned, you know, chocolate brands are thinking about e-commerce. Um, brands like, you, you know, Unilever, all of a sudden the e-commerce team, it becomes very popular because they need to figure out how they're going to reach people in their homes and think more like a direct-to-consumer brand. And we keep thinking direct to consumer brands are these little niche beauty brands or the Pelotons of the world that go direct to consumer. And all of a sudden P and G Unilever, all these big brands had to start thinking like a direct to consumer brand because people were buying at home and having groceries that previously weren't being shipped home, shipped home. So how do you get, it, it really kind of evolved into a shopper marketing strategy. And I think that's where when you talk about brands that are doing it well, they're the ones that are getting out there and communicating and providing those alternate options and ways for people to, to shop and, um, and love the brand even more. So, you know, Hershey's or any of the FMCG brands, brands that sit in a grocery store really couldn't stop communicating, <clears throat> but they had to communicate in a really sensitive way. Sorry. <coughs> True. True. Um, good. Uh, you touched on something and that takes us into, you know, the next area that I wanted to talk about is 
you know, sometimes out of all this um, chaos, you also see a lot of innovation that comes, comes out of this. So I wanted to ask each of you, you know, from your perspective, what do you see um, going uh, forward? Stacy? you started to talk about it, about, you know, how some of these habits are gonna stay um, because we're beyond the, the 40 days. If, if you wanna elaborate about that a little bit, that would be great. Sure, so I think that somebody I, I know said that they were gonna write a book about the COVID area, era and it's gonna be called You're On Mute. Because um, <laughs> that's our most favorite phrase. Uh, so I was, but okay. So Lynn st spoke of these and, and I have to just echo them. I think that telehealth was waiting for its moment and it's found it. And we had, we had seen little glimmers of it, you know, people, I forget what, it, what the name of the company is that offers um, therapy for people, you know, just, you know, psychological support. That's, go, that's like a no brainer. I myself had a visits with an allergist and a dermatologist and we're all, we've all learned that we don't need to spend an hour traveling, a half an hour waiting, and then another hour traveling back to have a conversation with our doctors. And so I think that telehealth is here to stay. Ditto with what everybody was saying about online shopping. You look at Walmart having chosen this as the moment that they're going to go up against um, Amazon. I think that PepsiCo has started its own consumer shop and, and people have learned how to shop differently and they're shopping, they're going to the stores with lists. They're doing that. So the frequency of visits to the stores, I think is going to change and the reliance on online shopping and, and products like Instacart are definitely here to stay. I, I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen to the fitness industry. We, you know, Peloton, I myself am a, you know, a, a card member, card carrying member of the Soul Cycle cult and have a bike in my basement. And I'm questioning whether I'm going to go back to the studio. I can, I can take a bar class and a spinning class in the time that it took me to get to the studio. So, and I think that a lot of these self-care kinds of products, whether it's beauty products, I personally, again, learned how to give myself a pedicure, um, facials. I, I think that many of these kinds of things that we had just gotten into the habit of doing, outsourcing, we're gonna start kind of doing ourselves. Another thing that I think is gonna be really interesting to watch is cooking. Mm -hmm. Many, many people learn to cook during this. And personally, I would like to take a six month vacation from it. <laughs> but I also know that cooking at home and the appreciation for how to cook meals, Companies like Blue Apron and Marley Spoon and Fresh and all of those other boxed product, meal products have really just mushroomed during this. And people have come to appreciate the value of products like that. And, and I, I think that they are definitely kind of here to stay. Um, so I, I think that, again, I, that's why I, I said to start, it's a planner's dream to see how people are learning new skills, learning and learning how to take care of themselves and are gonna go, do it going forward. Yeah, who okay. ever the sourdough bread? Yeah, you know? exactly, right. <laughs> Everyone's tried it, but no. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, Lynn, what I wanted to ask you, I mean, uh, you know, we saw a big rise in linear TV viewing, which of course would have been expected with everybody staying in. But do you think that's something that's going to stay past the pandemic? Are we going to go back to the old or, or, you know, turn to something else? I think linear grew, but it grew as all viewing grew and it didn't grow in the same pace as streaming. So I okay. think 
streaming is going to dominate even more and people like if you didn't have Netflix and you weren't watching Tiger King back in March or April, I don't know what you talked about on your Zooms, right? So <laughs> that kind of that type of being tapped into like what's hot and has been a connector, a social connector during this time. And I think that's super interesting. So I think the challenge for brands now is how do you penetrate that world of a non-ad um, format and so I think you'll see from marketers a huge rise in better integrating into content which I think mm -hmm. from a media agency perspective just opens up a whole new both opportunity and challenge and to do that correctly and not just you know someone turning to the camera and being like want a pep want a coke like like it's got to be more integral to the entire program and it has to again align with the brand so we've been really honing that skill of what those partnerships are and what we've found is and i think this will happen a lot more and maybe it's getting back to the golden era of you know theater brought to you by campbell's soup and we're getting back to that time of you know, we're connecting with the creators of shows and partnering with them brands as they're thinking up the concepts. So it feels very organic and not an add on of like, oh, did she drive a Lexus? No, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so um, just from our perspective, we, we have UM Studios, which does our content. They're actually connecting with um, Kenya Burris. We have a deal with him um, who, if you're not familiar, did Blackish, and now he has um, Black AF on Netflix, and he's doing Coming to America too, which I couldn't be more excited about. But um, and so some of our brands are going to be in it, but in a very natural way. Knocking wood, I haven't seen it yet, but um, so and actually Black AF, there's a whole episode built around. It's about a um, a upper uh, class black family of Hollywood in Hollywood and they're still you know face some of the unfortunate situations that we hope go away one day and you know the black Amex card actually helps them in different ways so it's kind of, it's on Netflix right now so I didn't spoil it for anyone <laughs> um, so it I think it's like the viewing habits are changing the type of content and you know, on demand and viewer choice was obviously dominating before COVID. I think it's taking over after COVID. I choose what podcasts, I choose when. I choose what shows, I choose when. I choose if I pay for to not have commercials or keep commercials. So you have to keep the balance. And I'm not by any means saying linear TV will go away, but it won't grow at the same pace. Okay. And on the side note, I feel bad for things like Quibi, which we're going to start before the pandemic and be like the commuter's dream of like being able to consume content in the subway or a bus ride. And now they've kind of are desperately trying to find their way in a world where they're not as necessary right now. So, right. Right. You know, yeah. yeah. So Amy, um, in your, in your field, I mean, there's a lot of AI and these little Michaela's and stuff. Could you, <laughs> could you talk about that a little bit? What innovations that you see coming out of this in your area? Yeah, the world of the, the virtual influencer. Um, yeah. No, it's, it's interesting because I usually when I'm talking with clients who are so perplexed about this concept, like why would anybody pay a, an AI or a virtual influencer to influence a brand? And it's funny because we're almost primed since childhood to listen to virtual characters telling us how we should behave and how we should listen to our lives. I mean, Disney's full of them. Um, you know, we've, we've listened to uh, Sesame Street characters um, that are created characters for a really long time. So I always say it's not so much of a leap that we wouldn't necessarily be intrigued and entertained by virtual characters. Um, so, you know, little Michaela has, is probably the most high profile um, in virtual influencer. Ikea just did a 
huge campaign um, with a virtual influencer um, and the way they live their lives in these virtual rooms that IKEA has put together. And I think, you know, they're not going to go away, but I think from an authenticity perspective, it's not going to be what, um, you know, truly, um, you know, really brands that want to connect with a consumer group on an emotional level, it's probably not going to come through as clearly with a little Michaela or a virtual influencer. That said, I think there's a long way to go. We're literally at the very beginning of virtual personalities and characters. And one of our other group companies, AI Foundation, um, you may have heard about the AI Deepak Chopra. He was on um, Jimmy Fallon, um, and I can share the links for that. There's an AI Salvador Dali in the, uh, the Dali Museum in Florida. Um, these are virtual humans, um, and they are they're replicas of um, you know, an, an individual with that AI intelligence. And I think that, if you wanna see where things are going, um, that's where it's going. We even created a virtual uh, influencer for our Cover Girl campaign. Um, it was uh, Kalani, who was a uh, dance mom's celebrity. Um, and we created a virtual persona for her. Um, and what that really does for, from a marketing perspective, if you think about the scale is two things. Number one, this individual who is virtual, who's AI, can have millions of one-on-one -on -one conversations simultaneously um, about not just what they believe in or what they are interested in, like dance, for instance, but also questions about the product or the brand. So in CoverGirl's perspective, could issue coupons, could talk about makeup tutorials, things like that, provide resources um, in a human-esque conversational style. From a data perspective, it's amazing for brands because people, because of chat, and because especially Gen X, Gen Y are so used to chat, they will chat along, answer questions, uh, you know, provide context. All that's data that can be mined for new products, for better ways to service customers, to um, you know, identify cultural trends. So I do think the idea of a virtual influencer or an AI persona is definitely at the early stages and we're gonna see a lot more of it. Okay, well, good, good. I think um, given, given the time, I think we're gonna open this up for questions. And I forgot to say this earlier. Um, for those of you who are viewing, there's a survey at the end. So we would ask that everybody please stay on and um, take the little survey at, at, at the end of this. So, um, Let's just see what questions we have here. Um, so this is an interesting uh, one. You know, we talked a lot about uh, humor, you know, to add some levity to the, the situation. But what do you do? And um, I know this as well from working on pharma. Pharma brands want you to avoid humor because they don't want you to appear insensitive. Does anybody, do any of our panels have any answers to that? What was that discussed at all um, during COVID? Uh, Linda, I can um, hop okay. on that because they're, I, the pharma clients, and by the way, they're, they're calling themselves healthcare these days. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just, I, I was just called out on that recently. There is a very fine line to walk. Yeah, because we can't be seen to be laughing at people who are suffering. But I think that humor as in humanity and just recognizing people, we hear all the time when we speak to, um, to patients that they don't want to be defined by their diseases. So they don't want to be put in the bucket of, you're a cancer patient and cancer is a sad, scary condition. And so we should never have anything but sad, scary thoughts. So I think that we, it's not a ha ha kind of a humor, but there is definitely room to expand the boundaries. And, uh, and I know that the clients are very, very sensitive to it and it's going to be a, a slow process. 
I haven't seen a whole lot of it. And I do work with a lot of pharmaceutical manufacturers on some pretty esoteric conditions. But there are places where just showing people being able to kind of laugh at themselves a little, you have to pick your moments. But I, I think I, I think that the biggest thing, and I'm sorry to ramble, but is that pharmaceutical advertising in general or healthcare advertising it has gotten to be so of a tone and that there's a real opportunity for, for marketers in pharmaceutical companies to find a way out of that tone so it doesn't feel like your condition goes here. Mm. That it, it feels like it, it has become quite commoditized or generic or it, it just doesn't feel fun. You know, we talk about the importance of brands and yet the brands don't allow themselves real personality. So I, I think it's an enormous opportunity and we're working really hard with clients to try to get them to understand that. Okay, good. Um, another question is about, um, and this anybody uh, can take, the brands that we've been talking a lot about, brands being more human and providing a more comfort feeling uh, so that they, it, you know, strengthen their relationship with their consumer. But the ones that aren't doing it, um, is this going to hurt them? That's the question, you know, coming, coming out of this, um, the brands that let's say have stayed silent or really have just gone on, do we see them slipping, uh, when we come out of this? I do, um, especially with younger generations, um, not to always pick on Gen Z, but that's always such a focus. Um, and they really expect their brands, like there have been, I'm sure Stacey knows this far better than I, tons of research about how Gen Z expects a brand to know them, know them personally. Um, and that's the, both the joy and struggle of having all the data that we do is how do I really get to know individuals? So I think people that haven't been speaking to them and haven't been relevant to them will have a harder time, not out of anger or anything. It's just that people will be moving on and they'll be finding their own solutions during this time. And um, so I do think it is, and I know it sounds maybe self-serving being in a media agency, it is dangerous to be quiet at this, at this time I on a whole host of issues. I'm just gonna say, I back that too. I think for at least in the most recent advertising um, era, people do seek out brands that align with their values. And um, when brands are being silent and another brand is being vocal about what they stand for, people will gravitate toward that. And especially in brands where switching is a big decision, once they've switched, it's pretty difficult to go back. And I think you're seeing a lot of this in the, the beauty industry where people, um, while there is still a lot of sampling and there's a lot of you know, people trying things, once people find a product that works for them and aligns with their values, switching them off of it is gonna be very difficult. Um, so I do think we've seen it, especially with influencers, the use of influencers to really uh, reinforce what the brand stands for, what they support. And with influencers and specifically, brands choose influencers based on alignment of values and message. So um, when an influencer is saying, this brand really aligns with what I believe in, and I'm you know, sure I'm paid, but um, I'm sticking with that brand for a long contractual community engagement. So for instance, a lot of our brands, we, when we uh, you know, sign up influencers, it's not for one product, one post, it's for an entire year. So their communities see them dedicated and committed to a brand for an entire year. Um, it does reinforce, you know, the values of the brand and people make those purchase decisions based on that. Good. Uh, you know, just myself to build on that, um, I showed in uh, the course the uh, last week or so, Keen Footwear has been doing this for a long time, Vogue for Love, but, um, they've ramped up that campaign, you know, in, uh, tremendously 
in these past few months, given the year that we're in, and they just want to get out the vote. And it was interesting because a lot of the students said, oh, I'm going out today and buying Kane shoes. I'm ordering them online. You know, it was an immediate connection because they applauded what they were doing and they might never have looked at King footwear, you know, before. Um, going back to, you know, we talked a little bit about how experiential advertising and events and stuff like that, you know, just sort of um, stopped. So somebody's asking the, the question, do we think when um, we go back, if we ever get back to some sort of, um, it, it won't be the same, but will we see experiential marketing increase or will um, direct to consumer strategies, you know, will, will they have evolved? I think it's both, to be honest. I think you'll see a real, when, when people feel comfortable, I think people are going to crave that human connection, that being back together, mm. um, you know, movie theaters. And it will go back to the way it was, probably not, but I think you're going to see that. But I think the direct to consumer um, shift in terms of our purchase habits, the way we go about researching products, the way we go about um, at, you know, shopping online for things, um, even the fitness industry, I, I do 100% agree that that's changed forever as well. Um, mm. It's kind of one of those things that's additive. It's going gonna, it's gonna to evolve and change. Um, I do think experiential will come back though. Okay. I, yeah, think I, would, I would echo that too. In fact, everything I've read about Gen Z is that they are really, experiential is really, really important to them. And that what we're going to find, even with this move towards um, um, online shopping, that we're, we're finding middle grounds. And there are going to be ways that people can have in-store experiences, but yet do per more purchasing online. So there's, yeah. it's, it's the, the world is going to reflect what's happened now for a long time to come, not necessarily because we need to, but because we've learned that it's better. Right. I would right. agree with that. Like brands like Warby Parker are sending you 10 pairs of frames so you can try them on at home and not have to go to a store. And I think we're all gonna become more accepting and I don't know how long it will last, but like, I agree experience, experiential will kick in again, but there'll be safety protocols, right? Like you may, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to get your temperature checked before you go into a football game. You're gonna have to use hand sanitizer before you take a sample, you know? And I, so it will change, it will make it slightly different, but people are at the end of the day people and not pieces of data and they want to connect to people <laughs> i want to we're, we're getting towards the end i want to squeeze in one question that has um come through that's a little a little bit different from what we've been talking about but i think it's it, it, it's worthwhile and for the other questions that we're not going to get to I'm going to capture these because I think we can answer them. And I think there's some very, very good questions and we'll answer them, you know, via an email or something. We'll, we'll figure that out. But one question from, uh, is that if you are, you know, a junior person in this time and you're working in an ad agency, you know, you're an intern and you're on these, um, zoom calls, uh, what would you suggest to these um, young, talented people, how, how to get noticed? How do you show your value, you know, when it's all of the senior executives yapping? <laughs> how do you make an interpersonal connection when well, you're remote? You know, we're trying, we're all actually trying to f learn how to figure that out. And I think that it's, it's almost more incumbent upon the senior people to try to figure it out than it is for the junior people to try to figure it out. I, I think that we all, we're actually going to get trained in the next couple of weeks on, how, on good Zoom protocols and how to, how to really have the best meetings. And I, and I think that as a junior person, you have to pick your moments 
and have something kind of interesting to say and then be willing to stand up and say it and don't be intimidated by all the big mouths and the big shots on the line. I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think it's very similar. I mean, we've had to onboard people that we've never met in person, um, which is, you know, a new experience completely. But one of the pieces of advice I always got when I was coming up young in the advertising industry is imagine, you know, because at the time it was, you're in a boardroom and you're with a lot of clients and you're with a lot of senior people, how do you behave? And I think it's the same sort of thing. It's listen, take notes and have private conversations with those people either on Slack or separately. And to Stacy's point, just make sure that any comment that you, you know, speak up with is well-timed, well thought out, and um, it will be respected. Like we want, we want to hear from junior people, um, but it's about really understanding the audience that you're with and when that well-timed comment is appropriate. Good, good. Well, I'd like to um, extend a huge thank you and, and uh, I'm very, very grateful to our three panelists, Amy, Lynn, and Stacy. I think this has been very stimulating, very thought provoking. Um, and I can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing your experiences and, and your wisdom. I can't find my little clap thing, but <laughs> big, big round of applause for, for all of you. <laughs>